Hi, welcome to Cottage Industry Fibers, episode four. Today is May the 30th. Um, it's a Friday, but I'm not thinking you're going to see this till Saturday at the earliest. But thanks for coming and um, taking a look. If you are returning, thank you so much for coming back, and I hope to get the chance to interact with you more online via Ravelry or um, Clerk or Instagram. I'm Continental Kim there, so would love it if you'd come and check out the group on Ravelry. It's Cottage Industry Fibers podcast group. And um, if you're new, thank you so much for uh, giving it a try. I appreciate you checking it out. Well, uh, today I am trying a new camera, so we'll see how well this is going to work. Um, hopefully I don't wind up having to re-record from a different camera, but um, if so, it is what it is, you know, still learning and still getting this going, so I'm not terribly worried about it. With that said, let's go ahead and get into um, some works in progress. Oh, wait. First... I am Continental Kim. I don't know that I said that. I'm Continental Kim. Um, my actual name is Kim, uh, but you'll find me as Continental Kim on Ravelry, Instagram, and also on Plurk. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so works in progress. I know I just recorded a few days ago, but I really just recorded the things that I had been working on during vacation and then uh, it's been a few weeks since I got back from vacation and now um, I wanted to talk about some of the things that I've been doing since then. Uh, really there's just three knit projects that I've been working on. Uh, one of them is the uh, heirloom netting project that I mentioned uh, a little while ago, I think it was two episodes ago, where I was going to be talking about uh, different needles that would work well for that project. So let me go ahead and get that. It's not in um, a project bag or anything because just the way, if you saw in that last episode, I have to have the yarn kind of on this um, reel system. I don't know what you can see or what you can't see because this camera doesn't show me a preview, but um, anyway, so I have the yarn on there and I can't really travel with it at all. Um, so let me show you. I'm knitting this on my signature straights, uh, size one, and let me show you real quick. I don't know how well you can see, but there's... Um, there's a, 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 just a piece of DMC cotton that I am running along the edge every time I turn on both sides. And what that is for is, I'm going to have to go back and pick up for the edging. So it, with that running through there, what that will do is make it a lot easier to pick up. But just to show you the progress, let me see if you can even see that. I think I'll probably... Can you see <laughs> that? Let me show you. I guess stretched out, that's probably about four inches of progress, maybe. But when it's not stretched out, it doesn't look like very much at all. And that is 48 rows of knitting. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so Heirloom Lace Projects you see um, they take a little while to look like they're starting to become something but even so it's very interesting knitting and keeps my mind occupied so so it's good but okay I also wanted to show this heirloom lace knitting a little bit because um, it's so tiny and it's kind of hard to show in a photograph so I thought I would show a little bit on video but the one thing I wanted to point out um, really quickly is in this particular project it's really important to have these um, this is just DMC cotton um, but it's a running line that comes up every single time I come to this edge because I'm gonna have to come back after I'm done knitting the stole and pick up these stitches 
and being so tiny, I cannot see how, um, well, I mean, I suppose you could do it, but it would be really challenging to come up and pick those stitches up if they weren't being held. So all I do is I make sure before I start knitting to bring that from the back to the front over my working yarn, um, and then I can take it from there. So uh, I just start knitting. This particular chart of this pattern requires five plain stitches to start. And I'm trying, I'm using my GoPro for this, and it's actually on a, um, a strap that goes, uh, you know, around your head. So I'm really trying really hard not to move too much and, um, you know, throw everyone off and make everybody sick. So just checking out my pattern here and then going to get busy knitting. So see how because everything's so small, it's actually really important in this case to um, have those tiny pointy little needles, you know, tips of my needles, um, you know, for knit two togethers and uh, slip slip knit, it's not as important, but, you know, when you're talking about trying to, you know, do center double decreases or, you know, something along that line, it can get pretty challenging without a, a nice sharp tip. The other thing I wind up doing too, um, quite often, is when I'm ready to work multiple stitches together, um, I tend to take my fingers down here that are gripping this fabric and pull down just a little bit to you know, open up that stitch a little tiny bit more so that it, you know, I can get in there with my needle. But, anyways, this is where I'm at so far. This is one whole, you know, bit of one chart, and now I'm moving on to the next chart, so. Right now, these are my signature size one straights, and they're going to work great for the stole portion, but not so much for the lace edging. But um, what I had mentioned before was when I first started knitting this, I started knitting it on um, a Chaogu lace needle. Let me get that here. Um, so this needle here is what I started on. And I'm going to get my notes because I took notes on the different needles that I used just because I wanted to make sure I explained what the differences were and what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, I started on these needles uh, with the, the, you know, really sturdy, the, the Chow Goos have this really sturdy red cable. And um, the cable itself is great. The join is great right here. But what I didn't like was for this particular project, and what I'm talking about now for all of these needles only relates to heirloom knitting. So really tiny yarn, really tiny needles, um, lace work on both sides. So, you know, more complex. It's not your everyday knitting. But, um, well, maybe for some people it is. But anyways, so the tips themselves, I don't know how well you're going to be able to see that, but 
they were kind of blunt for trying to get into the really tight areas. So that's when I decided to switch to the Signature Straits, which are really perfectly made for this project. Um, you know, the long straight needle, there's plenty of room on here because it's a stole. I don't know that I mentioned, I'm making the Williamson stole. It is a free pattern available. Um, you can download it or get to the link through Ravelry. So, um, anyways, so the needle is perfect and it's a stiletto point straight. So you can probably see that there is a much more um, pointy tip on that. Which, that's all fine and good and it's going to be great while I'm doing the rectangular portion of the stole. But as I mentioned a second ago, I'm going to have to pick up along all that edge and essentially all the way around the stole when it's done to add the, the edging. There's a lace edging that gets added afterwards. And these straights, I don't think they're going to work for that because I'm not sure yet, but if that lace edging is knit in the round, there's no way to use these straights. And even if it isn't, along the long side, the long edge of the stole, I, do, I don't think it'll work either. So I wanted to see which cabled um, needle, which, excuse me, circular needle would work best for that. Um, so I did try some signature stiletto point circulars in a size one and of course leave it to me i didn't bring that needle out but anyways so it's the same manufacturer it's still signature um but the problem i had with the signature circulars not the straights was that the join kept on getting snagged so that wasn't going to work uh, for me, you know, when you've got real thin yarn, if it's going to get snagged on that join, uh, again, don't get me wrong, I love signature circulars, but this is the first time I'm trying to knit with a cobweb weight, and um, that join is it's just snagging too much. So then I ordered something that was recommended. These are the Flegel, F L E E G L E, I'll put a link in there. These are the Flegel bamboo needles. Um, they were recommended, I believe, in the pattern. The cable itself is very flexible, uh, so that's nice to work with. And um, I'm just looking at my notes. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing with this one is, see, I don't know if you're going to be able to see. The way the join is, is this kind of tubing is just kind of, it's strongly adhered, but it's just kind of pushed onto this piece of bamboo. So it's actually not when the yarn is traveling in this, you know, when your work is traveling this way, that it's a problem. But it's as I'm knitting and I'm trying to slide the work down that it was catching on that edge. Now, let me tell you one thing about that. Um, that would not be a problem if I didn't knit as tightly as I do. One of the reasons I don't really care for bamboo needles and I prefer metal is because I knit more tightly. Um, so if you're a bamboo knitter, a bamboo needle user and you're, uh, you know, you know, don't knit as tightly, then these would be a really, really great option for you. And honestly, I'm going to hold on to them because they have one thing that, um, no other needle that I tried has. And gosh, you really might not be able to see this, but I'm going to put it there for just a second. That is um, a hole through the base of the needle so that you could thread like fishing line through there and run a, um, a lifeline through your knitting. And with heirloom knitting, that's a really good idea. Now, I haven't done it yet. I really should. Um, but anyways, so moving on. Great needle if you like knitting with bamboo and you don't knit too tight. Um, then I tried the Addy Sock Rockets. So this one here, I got a different, a few different sizes, but so Okay. These were all size ones that I was using. I grabbed the packaging just to show you the Addy Sock Rockets. Um, 
this is a size zero, but the Addy Sock Rockets, um, the tip was more blunt than the Haya Haya's, which I haven't mentioned yet, but I'll, I'll talk about those last. Um, the tip was more blunt than Haya Haya, and the joint's a bit rougher, but not by much. Um, these needles are really slippery, too, so the work really likes to move along them, so that's nice. Um, it's a great needle, but it didn't wind up being my number one choice because the Haya Haya that I'm going to go with was just a tiny bit better. So I think what I would say on these, and here, let me show you the tips real quick. Okay. So I think what I would say on these is um, if these are what you have versus a Haya Haya Sharp specifically, um, go with these. They'll work great for you. But um, my ones that I wound up preferring the most to anything else was the um, Haya Haya Sharps. And let me show you what they look like in the package. Okay, this is a relatively inexpensive needle. It's $8.50. I got it at the Loopy U. And um, this is the actual size one. The uh, tip is great. It's perfect for going in there. It slides nicely across the needle. It's not quite as slippery as like the Addy Tur or the Addy um, sock rockets, but still really good. And then um, this join here is really nice, and I didn't have any snagging at all. So once I switch over to the circulars to do the edging, definitely gonna go with the Haya Haya Sharps. That was it. That's all the. Those are all the needles that I tried um, for the heirloom knitting. So if you're looking to try it out, those are my recommendations, but you know, try what you've got and see what works best for you. Okay, the next project that I've been working on the last couple weeks, I've got it in another Slip Stitch Studios bag. This was one that I got, in a great little Halloween design. And this is just the single skein bag. It's got this great, you know, pull toggle and whatnot, but the sock that I'm doing is um, not the next one that I was planning on doing, but I saw something in the Interweave Knits and I just had to give it a try. Um, let me show you that real quick, actually. So I get the digital copy of Interweave Knits and this is the pattern that I saw and I thought was so unique. It's called Soulfully, um, and what it is, is it's knit, I don't want to give away too much because, you know, it's not a free pattern, but essentially, let me see if I can get a good picture of how it works here. The socks are knit bottom up, so I don't know if you can tell in this picture, but, um, Essentially, you knit the sole, you knit the sole of the sock in the round, um, you know, like you would if you were doing a toe-up sock, but you're actually doing the whole sole, and you shape that sole, and then you kind of start to decrease and work your way up and shape the toe and come through and work your way up into the leg. So I had to give that a try. I thought that sounded unique and I was interested in seeing a different construction method. So I am using my Alsterman Step in this great pink and gray uh, colorway and my, um, these are, these are high high sharps as well. Sorry, I couldn't remember. So this is a pair of high high sharps as well, and I've gotten I've gotten most of the foot done. So you can see it's starting to look like a um, a regular little sock, and see how the stripe pattern works because um, you're knitting like from the sole up, and then here's kind of let me get this open up. Here's kind of the toe shaping. So I thought it was pretty cool. Um, the only thing I would mention to you if you're gonna try this pattern is just make sure that you really get that uh, dimension that, that's around the, the diameter of your foot 
correct because one thing I didn't think of when I first cast this on is the stretch on this sock is going to be different than what you're used to. Usually a sock will stretch out around a foot like this, but it's actually stretchiest lengthwise, not diameter-wise. So if you have this going around the sock, if you have that too small, there's really not a lot of extra give there. So just allow for that to be closer to the actual dimension. You know, when I'm doing a regular sock, if my the diameter of my foot is nine inches, I'm going to want to finish sock at like eight inches so that I've got that, you know, stretch for a nice tough, cozy fit. But this, if your foot is nine inches, then shoot for nine inches because uh, you, if it's too tight, there's really not much you can do to stretch that back out. Uh, maybe maybe a little bit of negative ease, maybe eight and a half, eight and three quarters. But, but anyways, other than that, it's really kind of a cool pattern, and I'm looking forward to getting a little bit further with it and see what happens. Okay, I have one more project to show you, and I just realized that I did not bring it in with me, so give me just a second, and I'm going to run and get it. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. Um, let me first show you this cool bag that I got. Uh, I actually picked this up at the Smoky Mountain Spinnery, but this is last year's bag. I got this, um, it's a local artisan that makes them. And it's just the coolest bag. It's got all these big pockets out that come on the outside. And then they used kind of that ribbon yarn to braid the handles for it. And uh, then it's got loops up here that it, it, the braids go through to, to close up the bag. And just, it's really a clever bag. And it's got all these pockets inside. I hope you can see that. All the way around inside, there's all these pockets. And some of them are closed with Velcro. So that, um, you know, if you need it to be bigger, it can be. And if not, you just close it up and you're all good. Anyways, on to the project. So let me give you a real quick background on this. About a year ago, actually exactly a year ago in May, I cast on for the Lock Street cardigan. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm gonna look it up real quick to make sure I tell you that it is, I wanna give you the right person's name. So, okay. It's called the Lock Street Cardigan by Glenna C. And I cast on for it shortly after it came out because I really, really liked the pattern. And then I put it down for a long time. I had finished one whole front, so I had finished the whole left front. And um, But then I put it down for a while and had just shoved it in the drawer. It just became one of my, you know, dormant objects. Well, two weeks ago Saturday, I was going to a party and a friend's house and I needed something to bring with me for knitting but I realized the only two things I was really working on right now were the heirloom lace project which that was not going with me I mean that would be pure insanity and then um, the other project was the Aeolian shawl which is a beaded lace project so that wasn't gonna go either uh, I do have that sock that I just showed you but I don't know, I just felt like working on something a little bit more interesting, but not lace, you know, <laughs> I'm at this party. So I pulled out the Lock Street cardigan and um, pulled up my pattern and Ravelry told me that I had some updates to do on that pattern. And so I, I downloaded the pattern again for the new, the new updates and I noticed it looked a lot different, like the photographs were different and, um, but I didn't worry too much about it. Then I looked at the second, oh, <laughs> this is a cautionary tale, actually. So I brought up the, the new version. I went, okay, well, I've got the new version. I can delete the original version. So I went on my iPad, I deleted the original, and went back to the new one, looked at it, and started looking at the numbers and the counts, and everything was different the sizing was completely different. I realized that it, I couldn't just pick up where I had left off 
and start with the new directions because I would get two different size pieces. So I had to either find a way to get the old pattern back or try to work the numbers myself or the last option, which is the option I wound up going with, was to rip out that entire left front. Um, so I decided to go ahead and do that because I realized also that with the change in sizing, the size I had been making would not have fit me. So I would have gotten all the way done had I um, tried to go back to the old pattern somehow and find it somewhere. I would have gotten the whole thing done and it wouldn't have fit. So, you know, first of all, don't delete an old pattern until you've confirmed that you want to make the switch over to the new version. But um, also be willing to rip something out if it's just not working for you. Um, so anyways, this is being made out of um, Woolmise DK in the Magnolia? No, let me look. Oh, in the colorway So Long Kitty. And it's a really pretty kind of hot pink. Uh, I hope this camera is doing better on the colors than the other one was. If not, I'm getting a new camera because I'm done with trying to figure out what the heck is going on with these colors. But anyway, so since I recast on the left front, I managed to um, get it redone. So see, it's kind of a pretty cabled, um, cabled design where it's not cabling throughout it's just cabling you know in the front on both sides and then cabling in the back and i believe there's some cabling down the sleeve as well so i'm really really happy with how this is coming out now and just looking at it i can tell it will definitely fit better with the new sizing um so i got that done the, the left front i got redone and then um i've been working on the right front so that's where I'm at now. I finished, I'm just eight rows into the chart on, um, on the second, uh, second side. Now the pattern says to start with the sleeves, I think, and then do the back and then the right and the left front. But, uh, I didn't want to do the sleeves first because I wanted to, uh, base my gauge on the fronts and the back. Um, I tend to get a slightly different gauge for my knitting in the round for the sleeve. So I decided to do the front and the back first and base my gauge on that and then I'll do whatever it takes to adjust everything for the sleeves when I come to that. Um, you know, if I have to change needle size or whatever I need to do. But anyways, that's where I am with that. So help me stay on track with this. I really want to get this done by Rhinebeck if possible. That's it for knitting. Um, oh, I almost, it's, uh, almost forgot to tell you. These are my signature circulars. These are not the interchangeables. They have interchangeable sets, but they're, they don't call them the interchangeables. They call them um, modular or something like that because they're only, the cables only are interchangeable with the same size needle. So you can't really put like a size seven tip on one side and a, um, a size five tip on the other. You know, it, it just can't do it that way. So um, anyways, it's a size seven signature with a stiletto tip. All right, on to spinning projects. Um, the other thing I really wanna get done by Rhinebeck is my less is more cardigan. And that is a cardigan that is made from using you since so many times you get fiber and you only get four ounces or eight ounces of a pretty colorway at once um, this is made where you can use up a bunch of your yarn and and you transition from one to the next to the next to the next so you can you have all different colorways of yarn that you've spun or regular yarn if you don't want to spin for it um, and you can just go through and transition colors as you knit through so I've been working on yarn for that. I think I showed a finished skein early on, like the first or second episode. But I've been spinning for the next skein. And I have my three bobbins. I'm doing a true three ply. So I took the fiber, I split it evenly three ways, you know, weight wise. And um, have been trying to knit, uh, I'm sorry, spin pretty consistently to be able to 
get a good finished um, good finished yarn. So okay, I just wanted to show you a little bit of the current project that I'm spinning. This is um, into the world fiber with 60% uh, sorry 40% merino, 40% superwash merino, and 20% uh, silk. Uh, this is the colorway Cheshire from Into the World, and um, I'm actually spinning quite a bit of this particular type of fiber to go into a less is more cardigan. So I have about four different colorways that I am spinning, uh, all trying to keep them really consistent so that when I come together to try to make the sweater, it will be easier to use those yarns together. Um, and just one thing I wanted to show is when I'm doing a short forward draw, this is typically how I'll do it, is once I find the way that works best with this uh, fiber as far as, you know, ratio of twist to draft, I kind of try to maintain that as far as you know, drafting out the same amount each time and uh, each time I treadle. So draft forward with my right treadle and then bring my hand back with the left treadle. Getting a little bit out of sync here because I'm talking while I'm spinning, but um, anyway, so that is kind of how I try to maintain some of the consistency. Now right there I got a bit of extra in it that I didn't really want, but it all works out in the end. If I was really worried about it, I could just untwist a bit like this, draft it back out, let it, you know, twist back on itself. But it's it's really not necessary. In the overall yarn, it's, it's going to work itself out. So um, The other thing I tend to do, and this is just something I kind of started doing because um, it's what worked for me, is, I don't know if you can see, but when I start to draft forward, a lot of times I'll rotate my fingers just a tiny bit the opposite way of the twist, and that takes some twist out of this drafting triangle um, and makes it a little bit easier to draft. And then as I'm pulling forward, I'll let that twist go back in. And one thing I wanted to point out as well is, you know, um, my left hand I'm really just using for holding on to the fiber, but I'm not gripping it. it, it it's more for support than actually, you know, doing much with. That's, that's how I do it. I know a lot of people who draft, um, you know, with the fiber in their right hand and then draft forward with their left hand, but it's, you know, it's whatever works best for you. But just the one thing you want to avoid is um, putting too much grip on the hand that's holding the fiber because then, you know, the fiber, you can't draft forward at all. Anyways, so that's the project I'm working on right now. So doing a true, true three-ply with these. And uh, I'm shooting for a 16 wraps per inch finished yarn. So I'm trying to make my singles about 32 wraps per inch. I know that doesn't seem like it should work because you, with a three ply, you would think it should be, you know, 30, uh, 16 times three because you're putting three plies in. But that's, that's real, not really how it works with um, spinning because what happens is if you do a two ply, so if I do 32 wraps per inch, and I two ply them together, you know, they kind of wrap around each other like this, and they don't make a really full yarn, so it's not quite double thickness of those single, singles, if that makes sense. But when you put a three ply in, a three ply tends to fill the gaps. So, you know, when I go like this with my fingers, you can see there's kind of joins here, um, points at which it's a little bit thinner. Um, when you do a three ply, those areas are filled in and you get more of a, um, honestly, you know, nice full uh, yarn. So, so as a guideline, it doesn't always work that way, but as a guide, if you want a 16 wrap per inch yarn and you're doing three ply, you would shoot for about 32 
in the singles. So just double whatever it is, even though you're doing a three ply. I know it sounds confusing, but that's the way it works. And then, um, oh, I didn't bring in my other spinning either. I was in a rush today. It's been too uh, quick since the last time I, um, I recorded. So anyways, I'll just tell you real quick instead of running to get it. I've been working on a long-term Cormo sweater project. And I literally just finished up the very last of, I think, about three and a half pounds of Cormo. Um, I finished up the last of the singles, and that's going to get plied, hopefully, before the next um, time I record. So I can show you this yarn that I just showed you the singles for, and that plied Cormo. And hopefully I'll dig out all of that Cormo so I can show it to you. But that's really all I've been spinning the last couple weeks. I have no finished objects because I haven't gotten off my lazy hiney and blocked any of those projects that are still in that bag. I'll get around to it. I'll do it. <laughs> but just not yet. Hopefully next week. But no promises. So if not next week, sometime after that. Um, let me see what else. Okay, I think that's it for works in progress and spinning. I wanted to talk about um, stash enhancement. Yeah, okay. So, I've gotten a couple things recently and didn't mean to get this much, but, you know, it, it's one of those things where a sale comes along or an update comes along and you just can't pass it up, so... That's what I did. The funny thing is, is this is what happens when you splurge by. Instead of checking your stash and making sure what you've got before you purchase. Um, the local needle, uh, I think I mentioned, I, I know I mentioned it in the last podcast, that they were getting ready to um, clearance everything out. And I think it was 50% off everything in the shop. And so... I went in there and I only found a couple things that I really liked and wanted to get. I'm trying not to buy too much more yarn because I have a ton of it already. But I, I wanted to grab a couple things and um, what I got was, <laughs> this is kind of cool actually, I hadn't seen this before. Um, it's called, it's by Interlacements and it's called Rick Rack. And it's this really pretty pink and gray and it's this cool texture um it is let me see a hundred percent rayon okay so i don't know if you could see that tag really well or not but it is a hundred percent rayon and the reason i bought it it's not something i would knit, normally knit with but uh i really liked how i uh, or, I should say, I think I'm going to like how it weaves. So I'm going to put this on. I have a 16-inch um, shacked Cricut, little rigid head loom that I haven't used yet, or 15-inch, sorry. And I think I'm going to put this on there and see how that comes out. I think it's going to be kind of neat. Uh, I look forward to seeing how this texture plays with just your standard uh, weave. So that's that. And then the other thing that I got, because it was on Super Sale, was this here. And this is a uh, Chopovol, I'll try to, try to say this, Fliegende Untertasse. It's probably totally wrong, um, but this is what it looks like here uh, for the label. This is a German yarn. And see this one right here? That's the colorway I got, because I saw it online, I saw it showing knit like that, and I thought, that is awesome, I love those colors, it's so pretty, see the red and the purple, and there's kind of like a bluish purple here, a little bit of hot pink, and it looks, um, it's just really, really cool how it knit up. Well, what I didn't see, because I didn't have a picture of it, was how it is, uh, you know, it's not a skein, it's this wound um spool had i seen that i would have known that i already have this yarn <laughs> I, I mean literally like this color even 
So, um, anyways, you know, now I've got two. Maybe, maybe that'll be a giveaway at some point, but, uh, it's really kind of a cool thing. The other thing they do, too, is I don't know if you can see from this picture, they, um, wrap it two strands together so that you can, uh, when you unwind the yarn, you can actually unwind it into two separate perfectly matching balls. So when you go to knit your socks, your socks can actually match because they've been dyed together at, in pairs, if that makes sense, you know, as a uh, two strands right next to each other, they've been dyed that way. So, um, anyways, it's just kind of a cool thing and, and, uh, I, I liked it so much I bought it twice that's that and then the last thing that I got oh wait not the last thing okay the last yarn that I got was just like two days ago the loopy you tweeted that they had a, a yarn update for Walmai's in pure which is one of my favorite bases why did I say one of my favorite bases they only have four and I like them all oh oh well um so I grabbed some, some wool mice while I was there because it's so pretty to weave with and knit with and it's really just a fabulous yarn to work with because of all the bright and bold colors. Um, this one here is a color I haven't seen before because honestly I haven't got wool mice in a while. But it's called Gluckstag, I believe. Look at these colors. Can you, If this doesn't show up on the camera, I am going to take a picture and I'm going to edit it in like I did before. Because these colors are just amazing. So pretty. Oops. Oh, that didn't help, did it? So pretty. And you know this bright lime green? I never liked that color until I saw it in Walmice. Honestly, like years ago. But I am not an eye searing green kind of person. But... When I see it in these kind of skeins, I love it. Another colorway that I got, because I really thought that Kristen would like it, but if she doesn't like it, it might just have to stay in my stash. Uh, it's called Xaverl, X-A-V-E-R-L. Like I said, this is the uh, Wool Mice Pure, so it's 100% wool. Um, the beauty about Wool Mice, if you haven't worked with it before, is it is... 383 yards per 100 grams but what a lot of people don't realize is that each of these skeins is 150 grams so you're actually getting more I think it's like 540 yards or something like that 550 per skein there's a lot you can do with that there's a lot of shawls that are great single skein shawls but they're not quite big enough with just a single sock yarn skein so these Wolmai skeins that have that 150 grams um, are perfect for those kind of projects. But look at this one. Look at this pink with the gray and the black. Um, I just thought it was so pretty. And I saw it online and, and it really made me think of Kristen because she's a huge fan of pink. But um, the last one I got, yes, this is the last one I promise. These are my colors. I'm. You'll see me wearing purple and teal and green a lot, very jewel tone. But there is something about this particular color combination that I can't resist. Literally, if you dye yarn in these colors, I'm going to buy it. It's just the way that it is. I, I don't know why. I just am so drawn to look at this. Seriously. I'm telling you what, if this camera isn't getting these pictures, I'm done with it. Getting a new one. Um, but can you, can you see the hat? It's like this super vibrant pink and orange and yellow. And that combination, for whatever reason, just, I love it. I absolutely love it. Uh, this one is called Alegria, which I really like that too because um, there's a Cirque du Soleil called, uh, one of their, their shows is called Alegria, and it's one of the ones I've seen, so that's kind of cool too. I like that. Um, anyway, so that's it for yarn. I do have some fiber that I got too because, you know, there was an update. And Hello Yarn doesn't do updates terribly often. I mean, it's not like a regular every so, you know, every month or whatever thing. And um, 
I never am around for them. So I never get to participate. But this time, it just so happened that the timing worked out right and I was around for the update. And look at this. Now, I know this looks crazy because it's like a big old bag of fiber. But, um, look at this. Look. Okay, what this is, she puts these together and they are called patchwork yarn kits. Okay, so let me show you. I don't know. I hope that's showing up. Um, and what it is, is it's just a mix. You don't know what fiber you're going to get. It's all different colors. She does pick colors that she thinks will go well together. And I think each little bump in here is like an ounce or two. Um, and for a total of one pound. But it's a really great price for that pound of fiber. And I have seen some amazing yarns spun up. Just, you know, where people have just used everything in the bag and, and made a yarn. So I was really excited to give that a shot. Um, so I got one of the patchwork kits. And then I also got um, two braids of this Polworth top. Give that a second. Hopefully it's showing up. Uh, in Foghorn, the color's Foghorn. And it's got these really, really pretty grays and uh, blue and some brown. And that brown is almost kind of burgundy leaning in areas. So um, when this spins up, I think that these white areas are going to really soften some of the blue and the brown and uh, just gonna give really interesting finished yarn. I, that's one of the things I love about the way Hello Yarn dyes. First of all, the fiber is never, you know, felted or, or, you know, hard to work with, at least in my experience. But the colors aren't like chunks of color. They're not like big blocks of color, which is great. And I actually have other dyers that I enjoy for that reason. Um, but her colors for, for Hello Yarn... Uh, there's kind of just this, here, I, uh, the only way I know how to describe it is to show you. See how these colors are just kind of, it's like they're split and they're marbled and it, it makes for a really fun and interesting spin because with almost every time you draft that fiber, it's a different color because of the way that those fibers are blending when they come together. It's just a really, really fun spin. So like, see, you've got a real dark spot of blue, but it's right next to some white. So when those spin together, you're gonna get this really pretty marled look in that area. Um, so that's why I couldn't resist this. It just really spoke to me as far as the colors go. So, so it came home with me too, but um, I think that's really it. I'm going to, I did a little bit of uh, filming of me actually spinning, so um, hopefully you've worked that into the video, and if so, I hope you enjoyed that, along with um, a little bit of knitting on that Heirloom Lace, Lace Project. Let me know if that's something you're interested in seeing some more, and I can make an effort to um, try to do that with the projects that I'm working on. Just try to get a little clip of spinning or knitting or whatever it is I'm doing. Uh, hopefully I'll be doing some weaving again soon and um, really want to get going on some projects I have for that as well as some dyeing uh, that I've been planning to do specifically for weaving. So hopefully within the next few weeks I'll get that going and can show that to you as well. Hey everyone, I also wanted to mention that there is a current uh, a giveaway thread going on currently in the Cottage Industry Fibers podcast board on Ravelry. Uh, I had from the last episode some Masham roving from Smoky Mountain Spinnery, and I have uh, that. All you need to do is go in and um, re respond to that thread. I think the question that I put up was what's your favorite fiber that you've spun so far? Or if you have not yet uh, spun, what is intriguing to you about possibly learning 
how. So just go on in there and, and post an answer. And at the end of this week, when I record the next episode, I will use a random number generator and a lucky winner will get the Masham in the little bag from Smoky Mountain Spinner. So in that thread, we've gotten quite a few good answers. And not that there's a wrong answer, but anyways, there's um, some great answers in there already. But one of the people who responded is Karen SWB, and her answer was that she had recently got an inexpensive spindle at a wool festival and was wondering if she, um, moving forward, should invest in maybe a little bit nicer spindle or just save her money for a wheel. And um, I wanted to go ahead and just answer that here. It's easier than typing it all out because there's a couple things I wanted to show as well. Real quick though, um, you know, some people do great on spindles and don't care for wheels. And some people do great on wheels but don't care for spindles. Um, personally, I would encourage you to start with a spindle uh, because there's a lot of drafting uh, technique that you can learn with a spindle and go a little bit slower than you typically can on a wheel. But, um, you know, as always, just do what works best for you. So as far as whether or not to invest in a better spindle or um, save up for a wheel, without actually having tried a wheel, I, I don't know that I would give up on the spindle idea. Uh, and, and certainly there are great spindles out there that really don't cost that much. Um, real quick, I just wanted to show you just... A few of the spindles that I have and um, you know a couple little features about them but ooh, let me see if I can get them so you can actually see them here all right um, so oops, sorry I've got my computers kind of giving me a hiccup there Okay, so these are some of my spindles. And starting over here, we have, this is a Golding. It's a lightweight spindle and it's weighted around the outside. And that weighted ridge, you see here's very decorative, has a kind of a shepherd crook on it. Um, that weighted edge will make it so that it will spin longer. It's a very lightweight spindle. Um, so it's great for making really fine signal singles or working with um, delicate fibers. Not necessarily something I'd recommend for a beginner and also from the top edge of the price range for spindles. Um, then here I have two different Bosworth spindles. You see there's the same kind of general design, but um, the Bosworths come in a, a few different sizes. This one's smaller. It's a much lighter weight spindle. It's This is one of the specialty woods. It's orange Osage, and I know you can't really get a good picture of the color there, but um, a, a, another, this one will spin reliably, you know, all the Bosworths will spin exceedingly well, will, um, you know, be beautiful just to even look at, but, um, they're great, well-weighted, well-balanced spindles, so I cannot say enough good things about Bosworths. The only thing, if you're trying to get a simpler kind of, um, you know, maybe lower cost spindle, these are going to be mid-range or too high in pricing. Uh, this, these, both of these are specialty wood spindles with special shafts so they're kind of in the $80 range but I believe you can get a, a standard Bosworth um, in kind of the $60 range so that's a great spindle it's gonna last you a very long time as a beginner I think I would probably recommend going with the larger whirl it will spin a little bit slower but it will spin longer um, so you don't have to worry as much about keeping it going while you're trying to pick up and learn the drafting um, so yeah that's some Bosworth. Now there are plenty of brands out there other than these, but these are just some ones that I had to show real quick. Um, finally, this is the one that I would really recommend to anyone who is just learning how to spin. It is, oh it's kind of getting, there's almost too much light. Okay, so it's just a very basic spindle. This is the one, and a, one ounce version. It's got about a two and a half inch whirl. It's made by Shaft. 
and pretty much anyone who's a shack dealer will most likely have it. This is the other version. Um, there's actually one even a little bit bigger. Uh, this is uh, a heavier three inch whorl and it's significantly heavier than this one actually. Personally, um, sometimes a really heavy spindle is a little too much for someone who's just starting out because it's gonna make your single drop more often sometimes. As you start getting thinner with your spinning, um, uh, it, it will be harder, uh, easier, excuse me, to drop with the heavier uh, sp spindle. So um, I really like this one. The hook is, is a good size. It's got the nice notch here for you to um, hook your singles into so that you, you know, can have better control of that single while you're spinning. The other cool thing about these shacked spindles is, let me see if you can see. Do you see this notch up here? That makes it so that if you want to, you can hook this fiber around the end and spin it like a Turkish, you know, bottom whorl spindle rather than a top whorl, which is what this is. So I think they call this their high-low spindle. And I want to say you can find them online at like Woolery. Um, I wouldn't doubt if, you know, Loopy U and other places like that have it. And I think it's $25. So really not too huge of an investment um, and definitely worth it. Great, great beginner wheel. Um, spindle. So that's the shacked high-low spindle and this is the 1.1 ounce, which is one I prefer, but the three inch whorl would probably be good as well. Don't think I'd go up to the four inch because that would probably just be a little too heavy and that's more for when you're trying to do real thick singles. Um, at least in my experience. So uh, I think that's probably about it. The other question was what would be a good fiber to use starting off and that um, I would definitely recommend. I think Karen had said something about the undyed BFL that I was talking about in the last episode. That would be a great option but a dyed one would be nice too because um, BFL is a little bit longer staple than like a merino, so it's going to be easier to hold together. But with those colors of being after it's been dyed, it um, adds a little more interest. So it, it might be good for a beginner because it, it holds more interest in getting to watch those colors develop as you spin. But I know plenty of people who have started off with totally natural undyed fiber. So if you think that that would um, be of interest, I say go for it, you know. Um, I, I just would stay away from more of the really long staple length fibers and really short staple length. So something, you know, maybe um, two to three inches staple length, you know. I think that's about two, three inches. Something like that. So if you find a breed that, that's in that range, then you'd probably be pretty good with that. Uh, maybe even up into four, because I think Corydale tends to be up in a little bit longer, and I, I know Karen was saying that's what she had started with. Um, and I'm a big fan of Corydale, so I think that's a great choice as well. Um, sorry, my husband's checking in on me. So, <laughs> but um, anyways, so uh, that's all I really wanted to say about the spindles and the fiber. I hope that helps. If you have any more questions, feel free to message me on Ravelry or um, post a, a message on the uh, episode board. I'd love to hear what you have to say, and I look forward to seeing you again next week.